And the, so we're kind of caught in this, the loop, the circle, um, it, the vicious cycle um, of you finance the military to the detriment of other things. When you have a problem, the military always seems like the solution because it's the one thing that actually is pretty well funded. Thank you for watching this video. Please help us keep the show alive by liking and sharing this video and by subscribing to the show and making sure the notification button switched on. For those of you who can help a little bit more, there's a Patreon link down below where you can contribute wherever you can. Every little does help and all the money will go directly back into the show. You can also keep up with our latest content on Instagram at The No Show Pod, as you can see on the screen. As you know, The No Show is an initiative designed to make academic research accessible to everyone. So do contribute to the conversation, leave some questions, have a discussion, and I'll make sure I get back to everyone. So Adia, thank you so much for joining me on The No Show. I'm really excited that um, I can you know, ask a lot of questions that I have to ask about your research. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Um, so before we get into the, the meat of your research, and, um, and it's pretty vast, um, what, tell us a bit about, about your background and sort of what's driven you to look at, um, you know, questions of development and race and, you know, humanitarian, uh, humanitarianism. Um, it all comes from, <clears throat> so I, a long time ago, I guess it was more than 20 years ago, I decided I wanted to work in public health. So I went to public health school and um, started working on child health projects and reproductive health projects and got pulled a whole bunch of different directions on health development and humanitarianism um, through my work. And at some point I got a little bit, I was cynical and disgruntled and decided to um, pursue a, a PhD in, in anthropology to look very closely at the kinds of projects that I had been working on. So a kind of critical take. Um, at that point, when I decided to do that, I'd worked in um, a few different countries. So I'd worked in Nigeria and Sierra Leone, I think uh, Kenya. Um, and then during my doctoral studies, I, I, I did some consulting work in places like Indonesia and Nepal um, and started to get this comparative sense of what was going on um, with these different industries. And it's very interesting that you you chose the route of um, of uh, anthropology. Why anthropology to when you're looking at these sorts of issues? You know, <laughs> it could have been any. So I actually had like three or four things that I thought I was like, oh, I could do African studies. I could do development studies. But I happened to have a boss at the time, so my who had um, grown up in southern India, and said, "You know, I think you'd be a really good anthropologist." <laughs> and we were work, we were actually research. We were she was my boss. We were doing um, research on these reproductive health projects all over the world. And she she said I had something like an ethnographic sensibility, and I was like, I have no idea what that means. But cool, that sounds great. So that was one one per. She just basic. I know I was. I was actually pretty clueless about why I would do anything. I, the, the real truth that I, I never, I, I tell it occasionally was that I had taken the, um, the GREs, the graduate exam or whatever um, to get into public health school. And they, those test scores expire five years after you take them. And oh, I was no. in my fifth year of very close to those test scores ex expiring and I never wanted to take that test again. So I was like, I have to find a PhD program quick. <laughs> and my <laughs> friend said, oh, anthropology. So that was the first, but then the second one was I have this other friend who's, who's an esteemed medical anthropologist and physician. And um, I emailed him in desperation. And I said, Paul, I really need to know what I'm, I need to, what I'm going to do. And he says, it sounds like you wanna study like, power and political economy and health. And that's what medical anthropologists do. And I said, ah, oh, yes, that sounds great. And this was before Google. So I remember going into the search engine and saying, what is medical anthropology? <laughs> <laughs> and so I just, yeah, by this, I guess the skin of my teeth, I, I 
you know, sat down and wrote furiously, what project would I do? And how, uh, how does anthropology fit into that? And, and if I'm being also very honest, I even had an interview where a sociologist said to me, you could do this with sociology. Why are we anthropology? And I had no clue. I was like, I'm sorry, bro. I cannot <laughs> articulate this. And then some other person told me what the answer was. And I was like, oh yeah, okay. I'm going to write that down. Use it all the time. Uh, <laughs> so anthropology was actually an accident. Um, but I think it was a, a good accident because it's a fraught discipline, right? I'm sure mm. that's why you're asking me that question. Mm -hmm. um, it is absolutely rooted in colonialism. How do you rule people whose systems of governance are foreign to us is how the British would, would think of it. I'm sure the French did a version of it that was probably a little bit snootier. Um, and there's like a, but there's a, that, that actually surprisingly appealed to me because that was also the project of development as far as I was concerned, right? That was also the project of humanitarianism. And so how do you enter into a conversation about the history of the practice, the history of the theory, the history of the, all of that stuff without grappling with it? I, I think that that sort of appealed to me. Um, it's, it's, I mean, yeah. It's really interesting because I think well, you you mentioned it's a good accident. I think it's a fantastic accident that you got into this because, um, like you rightly pointed out, you know, before the recording, um, is that the the literature is so focused on one side, and it doesn't focus on the side of, you know, this this element of hierarchy and um, power and control, and you know, from from our just brief conversation before. Um, a question came up to me, and, and I think you're in a very good position to answer it, which is, is humanitarian and development how, the, how it's currently practiced and pervade? Is it just a subset of colonialism still? That's, that's a great question. Um... You know, I'm not sure if it's a subset as much as it's an inheritor. Like, mm -hmm. you know, like that, if I don't like to think in terms of phases and stages and evolution, it's sort of, that's my way of, of trying to think against the paradigms that I've been handed. But um, I, I, see, I see continuity in, in development and humanitarianism. So it builds on existing relationships that were in fact colonial, yes, or mm -hmm. imperial. Um, it, but I think it also, it's, it's like, a, maybe it is a subset, but I feel like it's a mediator of, of right. Right. colonial yeah, relations yeah, yeah. even. Do you know, like, um, I think of one example that people often use in, in the area that I study, like the, when the Ebola outbreak happened in West Africa, you know, they said, oh, the help felt, the help, help um, happened in, in the relations of colonialism, right? So in other words, Sierra Leone gets Britain, Liberia gets the US because you know the US colonized Liberia or did it? Um, and it, that's that's the big question and, and France to Guinea. But um, I think what's interesting actually is that the US was in all of those countries um, through the CDC. So, and, and the French were not nearly as present in Guinea as they otherwise might have been because of the, the relationship that they had um, in, de in the decolonizing moment, which is to say Guinea kicked France out and France took all they could. Like they ripped out the piping, they put cement in the toilets. They were like, if, you're gonna, if we're gonna leave, we're, we're, we're ruining everything. Um, and I think that represents the kind of relationship that France had to Guinea. So it isn't to say that France did not intervene um, out of a sheer sort of colonial whatever, but I think some of the colonial arrangements have shifted on the basis of, of um, kind of other kinds of relations. So, so US empire actually influences, you know, how, what influences the kinds of relations. Um, so it's the US and the UK working in, in, 
in Sierra Leone and the Chinese and the Italians and the Spanish, but the military power came from the British and the British side. So it's like, it's very interesting. There's a lot more intermingling of empires and, mm -hmm. and colonial relations. Um, they're hybridized because that's the, the new strategy for international cooperation. At least that's how I'm reading it. Um, uh, I think yeah. that's a very good reading of it as well, because, um, because you know, ultimately these um, empires are not in a state of war with each other, or all these former empires. I mean, in the case of the UK, uh, in the case of the, the US, uh, an existing empire is, is still not, um, you know, they, they st they, they've not been in a state of war with each other, which is what, why an explanation of them sort of having this intertwined relationship makes a lot of sense. But when it comes to sort of issues of um, of governance in those countries, when it comes to um, issues like uh, medical issues, in in the case of Ebola or in, in the case of um, COVID, ha it, do you feel like there's an element of competition between these um, former empires, or is it everyone's just kind of like looking to the US for their solutions? Oh, that's interesting. Um... I hadn't really thought about com competition. So there, there's micro level competition. So, and, and the way that I'm thinking about this is the, the, the setting is scarcity. So, so how, or maybe I should say the way that the, each of these problems, so health problems, development problems are framed in terms of scarcity, which is to say there's a set pot of money allocated to help. And so different groups are jockeying for a share of that, those resources to help. And those kind of scarce scarcity logics actually shape the distribution of resources within countries. So, and I saw that with HIV, right? Which is like, so I would see a health budget, which I was like, how can this be the health budget for an entire country of several million people? It is not the health, it's not the health budget for several million people. It's, it's what the government has allocated to health. And then there are all of these international groups that are also doing health work whose budgets are not subject to regulation by the governments, but they're providing care to people often under the auspices of public sector work. So how does, you know, how does that work? So that when I say that there's competition at that level because responsibility is sort of distributed amongst these organizations, these cor corporate actors. So there's that piece. And I think that's how, that's how US empire works mm -hmm. which is distributing it through all of these different um, bodies, different, you know, different governments different organizations that are non-governmental and via these global governance institutions, say like mm -hmm. the World Health Organization or, or something like that. So there's, there's that kind of distributed logic that I think creates competition for those resources. Yeah. Um, and then there's like this weird thing where people, where, where, the, where governments are competing to do to, 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 to minimize their risk while also doing the work of, of help, mm -hmm. help, right? So, so I, again, I, I'd like to, I, I like to think in terms of Ebola because that's the book that I'm writing right now, which is how do we, how do we manage to secure, keep the threats contained to where they are at as little cost to us in terms of the cost of human life, in terms of the cost of, of um, doing things in that country. So, so, so if you, the example of the US going to Liberia, they send 3000 troops. It costs a lot of money to send military to places because you have to, there, you have to establish housing for those people. The machinery is very expensive to transport. Um, just running, they have their, their own, they come with their own infrastructure. 
And so it, it's actually much more costly to run a humanitarian operation using military methods, mm -hmm. using military personnel, using military equipment and infrastructure. And so, but, but that happens so that they can protect themselves, right? The idea is that if we can just minimize the contact between say the US and Liberia, I mean, the ocean does that, <laughs> but also <laughs> if, we, if we can sort of contain the issue, encircle, enclose, Ebola or whatever constitutes the threat in that region, then we can, then we are protecting ourselves. So, and, and, and we're saving lives. But then saving isn't lives. that, it isn't, sorry, just to cut you off, isn't there a, a sort of an alternative point of view here where, you know, because the US is such a heavily militarized economy, it, it isn't the point of view that, well, it makes sense to give this contract to some military organization or some kind of you know branch of the military as opposed to give it to human beings who, who aren't who are civil and not not involved in the war machine it is the trap it is the trap that we are in in fact i think uh, alex duvall wrote this uh, pretty well he said this eloquently um and elegantly i think which is we kind of the us in particular has set a trap which is we finance our military to the detriment of other things thus the military always seems like the perfect solution because we have all of this stuff it's like again hammer and nail like yeah, yeah, yeah. when when you have when you are a hammer everything seems, looks like a nail um and the, so we're kind of caught in this the loop the circle um it the vicious cycle um of you finance the military to the detriment of other things when you have a problem, the military always seems like the solution because it's the one thing that actually is pretty well funded. Interestingly, and I this comes up every so often in the Sierra Leone case, I was actually having this conversation about, uh, it was a book, book thing for Paul Farmer's book about Ebola. And there were some uh, Sierra Leonean doctors on the line and they were talking about their COVID plans. Um, and I said, uh, I, I don't remember what the context was, but I asked, uh, I think it was about financing doctors. Like who, who pays the doctors? Who's gonna pay the nurses? How, how, how does this work under these conditions? And I said, and, and uh, I said, okay, so to this doctor, when was the last time doctors weren't paid? And he said, oh, a few months ago. And I said, when was the last time the military wasn't paid? And he said, 1992. Wow. And I, and I said, and why is that? And he said, well, actually that's why we had a war. <laughs> He's like, Night, the reason it was 1992 is that's when the coup happened, you know? And, he, and it was like this really, they got, they did not get paid. That you pay your, you know, you, you continue to pay your, your military, you don't pay your doctors. Then the military seems like the really correct solution for dealing with cholera which did happen. So there's a cholera outbreak in, in Sierra Leone and the military were actually central to, uh, <laughs> central to um, that effort. And it's also true that they were very significantly involved in the Ebola response. So the, the Ministry of Health and Sanitation was actually the initial um, leader in that effort. And then the president said, you know what, actually the military is much better resource and we would like and they're they're very hierarchical exactly very, yeah. right it's a command and it's a command structure they're organized and if they work with the british military we'll have the command center and run everything like you know like a well-oiled military machine um whether that happened or not is i think subject to debate but the fact of the matter is is everyone feels or many people feel much more comfortable having the military do these things because the military are sufficiently resourced to do them. So in the case of um, Sierra, Le Sierra Leone and um, examples that, that you've, you've seen firsthand and have, you know, are, are very, uh, you know, accustomed to, to answering questions on, in those cases, has the reliance on the military led to essentially 
a collapse or for better lack uh, you you know for to, to use a better term not, not collapse but has it led to sort of an, the underdevelopment of all the other branches of society and government uh, you know I, I actually think so um I think and and again I think that's why I talk about this sort of scarcity logic rather than devoting more resources they just sort of you know change the the proportion Mm -hmm. um and hmm. anyway yes yeah, so i do think that i think in this case yes um we're and and the u.s in particular is actually always trying to find new things for the military to do because we have in fact funded military to this great we've built all of these machines these beautiful machines it's why you know we talk about drone drone technologies being used for other purposes so including humanitarian relief. Um, the British case is, is interesting um, and one that I'm, I'm trying to deal with um, based upon this like museum exhibit that was up at the Imperial War Museum in London that actually put Ebola and ISIS in the same exhibit. Fight, it was called Fighting Extremes. And I was, you know, and I talked to, to the curator, I was like, what is this about? Like, why would you put ISIS and Ebola in the same exhibit and you know he had a like a couple of practical answers which was i have this money for contemporary warfare um it just so happens that the that the uk's military was um doing i guess withdrawing from iraq but also trying to um, address isis expansion into northern iraq and so and it just so happens that that was when we were doing the ebola work and so it just so happened that those things are happening at the same time. And, and I thought it would be great. This is, is this not just the very heart of the problem, which is, you know, we have, we have this, this, you know, con constant need to like show the world and remind the world that we are the saviors, you know, mm -hmm. and like in the case of Iraq, I'm very familiar with it because I'm from Iraq and, mm -hmm. you know, and I the the exhibition that you're talking about, I'm also very familiar with because I remember what the, all the crit criticism uh, about it. And so, um, and this is the problem. This is the problem with development and humanitarianism and and sort of having to having to wrestle with this, you know, this very entrenched colonial thinking that we have to think. I mean, our 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 current prime minister is very much in that world of you know we should have never left africa you know we should have yeah. <laughs> we should have uh, we should have never left these places around the world because we are the dominant human and right now having knowing that these guys are running the country um and now when you take that back to sort of some somewhere like you know Sierra Leone or somewhere somewhere in in West Africa or East Africa that might have some development money that's come to them or humanitarian money that's come to them it can't this money comes to them with predefined guidelines on how to use it or does it just come to them as you're a government and you deal with it uh, so that used to be the standard um... <laughs> And then the idea was, oh, they're too corrupt. They can't do, you know, they can't manage it on their own. It, it, it gets people to buy castles in France or whatever that, that you know, um, it, that so um, I think it's actually changing. But one of the things that does happen is it gets funneled through a bunch of different um, organizations. I know the U.S. the best um, and, and I think it's changed, but it used to be that U.S. money, U.S. government money went to U.S. organizations working in these places and so it's all about generating income for and revenue for the u.s so when i worked for um as a consultant for a usaid project um every project that we funded um had to have you know u.s cars u.s all right. equipment i had to fly u.s airlines <laughs> And which, you know, is hard. And so, I mean, it, code sharing has, cha has changed that. But I remember thinking, I really don't want to go to Nigeria on, you know, American Airlines because mm. it's terrible, you know, but <laughs> British Airways isn't any better. Yeah, and, exactly. and so um, 
I, you know, those kinds of things actually, and, you know, it's, it's, and I think about this a lot. So in Sierra Leone, when I was working there, um, before I was an anthropologist, I remember distinctly having, helping to write a grant, US-based organization that also had a UK office. And I remember distinctly how we were going to do, oh, the health projects for Kinema District, but then this other NGO that was, you know, based in, in the Netherlands is going to handle that one. And it sort of, they started to carve up Sierra Leone, mm. almost like the scramble for Africa, but like on, on a small scale and on a, 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 a development, but with a, a, an eye towards development. So there are all of these practices that look familiar to us. Um, you know, I, I'm actually really interested in hearing what those critiques, like those critiques of that Ebola ISIS exhibit mm. were, because I, when I talked to the curator, I was like, how? how do you not see this as a problem? And he's like, well, no, we, you know, we, even the, so the design of the exhibit was really, they wanted to bring these two things together to say, these are the extremes of, of UK involvement, which is to say drone, drone humanitarian relief. So we're just dropping aid, um, which then turned into dropping bombs. Um, <laughs> and, and, that's one extreme. And the other extreme is we're helping people with this virus live or whatever they thought they were doing. And it made me think, are these extreme, like what is the spectrum or what continuum do you see these things existing on? And now that you see them as existing in the same continuum, does that mean that you see them, see them as fundamentally alike as problems? Mm -hmm. And that's the big question that I'm actually trying, every morning I wake up to write about this and I'm kind of like, I'm still not sure what I'm trying to say, but, but it makes me, I've, I've been struggling with, what is it that, like, what do they think they're doing by putting these things on the same spectrum? And the UK isn't alone here. The US also said Ebola is the virus version of ISIS. Mm -hmm. It's a threat that has arisen from, um, disgruntlement and abandonment, you know, and, 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 and weak governance. And we have to have similar, we have to treat Ebola like it is ISIS. We have to keep it over there and have a perfect containment strategy. Mm -hmm. While also seeing it as a humanitarian mission. So it is not, it is, we, we don't, start with it being the humanitarian thing or or to alleviate suffering that is one rationale but the but the real justification is as long as we are interested in securing american or british values and safety we need to make sure that that stuff stays where it is that it doesn't spread well then the, the, this is the problem because you know um, the the world is like from, from the way I see it, and I could be completely wrong, but the world is fundamentally like de development and humanitarianism is designed through, you know, um, it is basically it's based on imperial designs. And if imperial designs are saying to you, you know, ISIS needs to stay over there, because as long as it's over there, it's not our problem. You know, like the Chinese virus needs to stay in China. The, this virus needs to stay over there. And so the, like my, my main concern is what of the, you know, the, the normal human being, the normal like woman, the normal man that, you know, has grown up in Sierra Leone or is just a normal citizen. And these issues are far, you know, out like they, they, they're just too vague for them to understand what they are or like to be in touch and distance of them. What of them? Where do they go? You know, what is their perspective on it? And I don't know if you've done any work on this or how you've spoken to any of the locals. I mean, my work is always about. So I guess there are two things that I'm doing. One is that I'm actually interested in organizations um, because I see them as a part of the fabric of the day-to-day. -day. So, and, and I, I guess one of the examples that I use is when I first started thinking about the sort of critiques of, 
of humanitarian economies is I used to go into the, so I used, one of my things is I always go to the markets, to the food markets, you know, as a woman who loves to cook, you know, and, and that's a place where I can see, see what is going on and talk to women and, and like figure stuff out. And I remember having a few different visits to the food markets and seeing, uh, like humanitarian bulgur wheat, you know, donated by the people, the, the loving people of the friendly people of the U.S., <laughs> our surplus bulgur wheat, which Sierra Leoneans, by the way, most, I'd say a majority hated because they were like, they're rice people. They're like, yeah, 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 yeah. you know, they're like, this stuff made me sick. Or, you know, like I, even when I worked in the HIV groups, support groups, there was a, one of the groups used to hand out this, this U.S. government bulgur wheat. And some people are like, I figured out a way to make this taste good. You got to put a lot of palm oil in it, you know, <laughs> but it, but it was like the everyday person actually is always sort of negotiating and navigating international policy, yeah, internet, yeah, yeah. right? Like down to the, the decisions about bulgur wheat and rice, like when Gaddafi donated rice and he was like, Hey guys, I gave you rice. And everybody was like, what happened to our rice? And the president's like, actually, it wasn't enough to distribute. So I invested, I sold it on the market and we used that money to set up the social security scheme. Um, and, you know, because folks were really concerned about this inflation on in the cost of rice. Um, so in fact, I would say if anything, the average Sierra Leonean citizen is not only uh, aware, but concerned about international politics and, and strategies. So for example, when the militaries that were not Sierra Leonean were moving into spaces, folks were kind of upset about it um, because does this, mean, is this, does this mean it's like war again? Um, some folks were like, oh, this is actually really good because it means that this is a serious problem and folks are taking it seriously now that some like white folks are here. So there, <laughs> there's that, that stuff, that, that stuff too, or, I, and I actually, this is the last thing, I'll, the sort of weird example or two weird examples. I lived with a, with the, in, in one of my guest houses in, in Sierra Leone, I lived with a guy who had like a bunch of cats that he brought from Azerbaijan. And I probably shouldn't, if, if I, the person who, who that is knows who he is, because how many people brought their cats to Sierra Leone from Azerbaijan, but his cats were finicky. And so there's this tuna fish that's supplied by Japan. That was nobody, again, nobody liked tuna from Japan because people like sardines and mackerel from different, you know, they had like, people have their fish preferences, especially when it's packed in oil. And that tuna would be on the black market. So I, when he, this guy was away and he was like, please feed my cats. <laughs> I had to go into the market and buy Japanese tuna, which technically we shouldn't have been for sale um, <laughs> for these cats. And the other one is this woman who sold herbs on the street. And I remember thinking she, she was actually selling cilantro which, or coriander, which is not actually standard in Sierra Leonean food, but she sold coriander, um, I think she had cumin. She had like all of these things. And I was like, why do you have all these? Why do you sell all these herbs? And she said, well, for the, it's for the Pakistanis. <laughs> you know, like, all right. She's like the Pakistani chef from the military battalion comes down here to get this coriander and cumin. So I have to supply, I, he, she was like the main supplier for the Pakistani battalion's herbs. That is crazy. And, but it's stuff like that, right? Like little, like every day, you know, that's the, that, but that's also when I started to go, oh, these connections are deep. Like they affect, they affect people on a very like basic level. Um, the, when, when the, when the battalions left, women, especially in the markets were absolutely talking about, well, what am I, how am I going to, sustain my business mm -hmm. you know if you're only selling coriander and cumin um, like how do you actually sustain your business or you're only selling lettuce greens to the white vegetarian lady from you know new york mm -hmm. how does that like what then does that um how do these sort of development economies or war economies affect day-to-day -day life 
um, if I can't sell my grapefruits at a, at a little at a extra cost for those people. Um, so I guess that's the, in that and that every crisis brings in that kind of economic shift or brings in these opportunities for folks that also might become mini crises yeah. upon evacuation or, or when, when things shift. And so that's, that's something that I'm also interested in, but it's also something I keep in mind. So when I talk about, say, human, like the hierarchies within these organizations, I'm also thinking about who is available, like who is available to work under these conditions? Who's, who's, whose labor is actually accessible um, to these organizations? Because like I couldn't do the survey work that I wanted to do on the basis of expatriates alone. I had to hire women who could read to enter refugee camps and speak one of the seven languages spoken there to be able to do this work, right? I needed to be able to, okay, something just blinked and that really worried. <laughs> um, and, and so all of these things actually, I think reveal something about everyday life, ordinary people um, and the situations they find themselves in. Um, we all, we're, we're connected and we're connected through these encounters and we're connected through these systems, these international systems. I, I think you, you put it, you, you sort of explained that Fun, in, in, in such an eloquent and fantastic way because you know it it sort of breaks down the realities that a lot of people have to face on a day-to-day -day basis and the fact that it's constantly shifting like it's not it's not you know there's no steady state there's always a change um now you mentioned something about the organization i want to touch on this finally um uh you one of uh, a research that you've done is was, was sort of looking at the the I suppose the racialization of these organisations and um, and how these should we carry on? Yes, yeah, so, it's possible that we would get cut up. Uh, we'll 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 wrap it up uh, just after this. So. You talk about the racialization within these organizations. Now, being a black woman, um, you said something that was very powerful, um, which is you said being American, being an American black woman whitens my presence, which is very, very interesting. So tell me a little bit about that. Um, I, you know, I, I, if you had asked me that, like, you know, a month ago, I probably, <laughs> I probably would have a different answer, but I actually was, um, giving like a kind of lecture at, at a university in, in Sweden virtually a few, a few weeks ago. And, you know, the folks had read my work and they said, how is this about race? Like, you know, you were there and, and what if the, per you know, like would this person be evacuated if they were um, say black, but from Europe? And I said, yes, <laughs> you know, that is true. That is, yes. Um, so I, I, um, when I say that, I mean that outsiderness in those places is, I think, inflected by the affiliation that you um, have or take on, the thing that brings you there to wherever you are. Um, and so, yeah, I, I'd say whiten's presence. It, it, occasionally I'll go somewhere and they'll be like, oh, she's a white woman because of, not because of how I look, but because of my outsiderness mm -hmm. and my affiliation with certain institutions or organizations. Mm -hmm. um, I do, I, I mean, obviously I, I can see it in other people. I can always tell when a person is not Sierra Leone <laughs> usually, and it's, and it's, I don't know if it's about how one carries oneself or inflection and body language or whatever, but there is, um, I can definitely see it in a way that I might not have seen it 20 years ago. Um, and so, so I, I, it's what, it's one way that I'm trying to, I guess, theorize about, um, racial organization or racialized organizations, and also this question of how it is that one can see race and racism 
in the practices of organizations Mm -hmm. while also like maybe acknowledging how the 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 kind of race structure that pre-exists the organization kind of maybe gets messed up mixed up a little bit with the organization Uh, um yeah I'm trying to think of it of a of a smart way to say that but um I guess one of the the examples I might use is I showed up in Sierra Leone like two or three years ago. I rented a car, which, and when you rent a car, you rent a driver, essentially. You hire a driver that you, no one will just hand you the car. And so it, the, the vehicle had the logo of the rental company on it, but it looks like the logo of an NGO. All right. And so when I, when I would roll up to like a health facility or whatever, because I wanted to talk to nurses about obstetric care during Ebola, folks were like super confused. They were like looking at the vehicle, like we don't know that NGO, um, but they, everyone was like clearing stuff out and they were putting benches out and stuff. And I was like, I'm just here to talk to some nurses. I'm not here. But because I'd been a consultant before, I recognized immediately what was happening. Okay. They thought I was somebody else. Mm -hmm. They thought that I was like the foreign lady coming to interview them for some NGO project. And so everybody was sort of frantic and they were like, they told us you weren't coming until tomorrow. (laughs) And I said, oh, I'm not, whoever you think I am, I'm not that person. Um, uh, I am just trying to figure, I've just been, driving around trying to find places that might have people in it who know what it was like to have to treat patients Mm -hmm. two years ago. And everyone got relaxed and just started talking to me about whatever, but they had pulled out all of their registers and everything. And they were, they were, they were, I was entitled to all of their information because they mistook me for somebody and somebody, and you know, someone could read this and say, oh, well, they just thought NGO, they just thought um, benefactor, you, you're at their beck and call. But I was like, no, there's, there's more to this. <laughs> that since that entitlement is kind of embedded in the institutional logic, right? And they know how this goes. Uh, that was like, a, yeah. There's, there's, and also, I mean, this is like an, an overt example of it, but one of the really su- subtle ways, which I think is a, it's a really brilliant way of, of pointing these things out that, that you mentioned earlier, which is looking at who CC'd in emails, looking at the, these sort of email groups and who CC'd in, in which kind of, um, you know, um, email or, or some kind of um, commentary. So, I think that's a really, really subtle way. So in, in, in both these cases, in the over and in the subtle way, is it ultimately the same thing that you are, uh, an NGO or the organization affords you this level of entitlement? And within the organization, you know, the more, I, I suppose, the, the whiter you are, the more entitled you, you, you can be. I think that's absolutely true. And I, I mean, one of the things that I often also have to remind people about is I'm, I'm not the rule, I'm maybe the exception. So, so it's not that you're going, you just aren't going to find um, for, for every, I guess, 10 Harvard School of Government, Kennedy School of Government, um, graduates or whatever. I don't know. I'm trying to think of some prestigious organization mm-hmm. that also like produces a lot of people, you know, that it this sort of has is a factory for manager managers. It's like yeah, a manager yeah, yeah. factory. But it's like, you know, the Harvard name kind of makes it somehow much more elite, even though, you know, whatever. We know, we know better. But the but the, the for every 10 white women of a certain age, there's probably only going to be one of me. Um, and that hierarchy, that that weeding out, that sorting happens way way before. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. It, it it doesn't start at you know amongst this group at that point. It starts mm-hmm. like from primary school. 
right? So whatever kinds of hierarchies exist in this in the sending place predict access all the way up. You know, like I'm happy now that I don't have to be the only one, right? <laughs> but it's still like all of these barriers start, they start at five. They start at five years of age, mm. like for many of us. And so what we get is like the concentration of your national hierarchy in the institution, right? Like, so that entitlement is, is bred early on and it's globalized, right? Like yeah. they're all, like, I just think about this one situation, actually it's a situation that I had where I was sitting with all of these uh, health care worker types or health public health types in an HIV thing. We're all having lunch and I've been invited and they've also brought like the white guy who's come for two weeks to do something, you know, whatever his two week consultancy is. And when the guy goes to the bathroom, they're like, oh my God, white people are so crazy. He wants to, he, he they were like, he wants us to go to the, the drug store, like the, the place where we're storing all of the HIV drugs. He wants um, cap, perfect counts. He wants the inventory logs. He wants, and they talk, kept going about all the stuff that he wanted, that he had demanded of them mm -hmm. in the short period of time that he was going to be there all he did was come in and need stuff. He wanted stuff. Mm -hmm. And they associated that with his whiteness. That's crazy. And, but I remember it was like white, and I remember writing in my notebook, wet men craze, like <laughs> white man crazy. <laughs> and they're just going on and on about this guy. When he came back, they were like, okay, well, <laughs> ready to go to the, you know, let's go to the pharmacy now, you know? <laughs> and but it was like this moment where I remember thinking, oh yeah, like I was that person though, who would show up for two weeks and be like, okay, I need all this stuff for my report. Mm. So get me in the car and take me to the place. That acquisitive, um, that acqu acqu acquisitive entitled stuff. Yeah. Yes, it exists, right? In the person, but it also is sort of like, naturalized through the organization it is a so, it is a professional uh, practice a hundred percent and it, and it's also like i mean it, it, if you look at organizations beyond just ngos and and these sorts of development organizations if you look at like certain certain career paths and you know like you know certain investment banks and people that end up in, in these investment banks inherit this entitlement and this obnoxiousness and that's why you know you have certain industries that are renowned for you know bitchiness or you know like being an excuse my language but being an asshole and all that kind of stuff so, <laughs> so surgeons like, <laughs> so you you do have that um thing and, and i think this is why you know speaking to you and, and having your sort of re research um you know, being opened up to 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 our audience is, is such a fantastic thing because you're very well suited to to let us know what it looks like on both sides, um, and I think your your research is amazing. And um, uh, you know, we'd love to we'd love to keep you know getting more of your work out there because, like for me, it's so rare to find it's so rare to find this um, lens that looks at development from both being, you know, like being an African-American or being black and being American. And so you can sort of, when you go to like a place like Sierra Leone, you can tell, I mean, there, there's a more of an organic relationship that you're going to have than somebody that's going to come in there and in two weeks asking for everything they can get. Right. <laughs> So I think, I think um, you know, I just want to thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us. And, um, you know, where can people find more of your work or when does your, um, your next book come out? I'm still working on the next book. It was due last year, but hey, COVID, um, hopefully it'll be out in 2022, early 2023. Um, you can find me on Twitter where I tweet all my hot and lukewarm takes at ethnography 911 ethnographic emergency it's also my blog ethnography 911.org um, 
yeah, if I were British, it'd be ethnography 999. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, so so those are the places. And, you know, I publish um, in a lot of public forums if I can. So there are some that exist for anthropology, African studies, um, occasional writing in, say, the New Humanitarian, New Inquiry, um, all of those kinds of places. Um, you know, once again, thank you so much for taking the time to, to speak to me and, you know, braving the, the situation that you're in right now. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. It was a lot of fun. Uh, thank you for watching this video. Please help us keep the show alive by liking and sharing this video and by subscribing to the show and making sure the notification button switched on. For those of you who can help a little bit more, there's a Patreon link down below where you can contribute whatever you can. Every little does help and all the money will go directly back into the show. You can also keep up with our latest content on Instagram at The No Show Pod, as you can see on the screen. As you know, The No Show is an initiative designed to make academic research accessible to everyone. So do contribute to the conversation, leave some questions, have a discussion, and I'll make sure I get back to everyone.